welcome again, everyone, to this afternoon's Parent and Community Workshop. We are going, we have the great honor to be with Dr. Bo Ancest this afternoon to talk about the links between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. And this is sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Ancest and Liz, you guys take it over and thank you very much for being here. We are very, very honored. All right, Dr. Ancest and Liz. I really wanted to say thank you to everybody. I know it's very difficult times to be in right now, but we really want to tell you about some exciting stuff that's occurring here at WashU. I want to make sure everybody is up to date on some stuff and also make sure that uh, people really know uh, some new developments that are going on. So as McKinney was saying, what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today is the links that we see between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease, and really a new path that we're, we're moving forward. So the kind of the outline is to, and I know a lot of you already know some of this information, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, first, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Down syndrome, some facts and figures. Then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, Down syndrome and sporadic Alzheimer's disease and the links that we see between them. And then I'm going to talk to you about this thing that we call biomarkers or measures that we see in the blood or in other ways or in the brain or even in sometimes uh, when we take pictures of, the, of people uh, and how that can help us understand what's happening with Alzheimer's disease and then how that translates to Down syndrome. Uh -huh. by, doing that, by doing that, we're also going to create a timeline of what these changes that we see and then uh, from there, we're going to be telling you about new research that we're, we're currently doing here. Um, and then I'm going to go through some of those results and then even tell you about some uh, the newest stuff is, which is even this potential for even clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome. So it's really a very exciting avenue and area, stuff that's occurring here at WashU. I wanna make sure everybody is up to date on some stuff and also make sure that uh, people really know uh, some new developments that are going on. So as McKinney was saying, what I'm gonna be talking to you guys about today is the links that we see between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease and really a new path that we're, we're moving forward. So the kind of the outline is to, and I know a lot of you already know some of this information, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, first, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about Down syndrome, some facts and figures. Then I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, Down syndrome and sporadic Alzheimer's disease and the links that we see between them. And then I'm going to talk to you about this thing that we call biomarkers or measures that we see in the blood or in other ways or in the brain or even in sometimes uh, when we take pictures of, the, of people uh, and how that can help us understand what's happening with Alzheimer's disease and then how that translates to Down syndrome. Uh -huh. by, doing that, by doing that, we're also going to create a timeline of what these changes that we see and then uh, from there, we're going to be telling you about new research that we're, we're currently doing here. Um, and then I'm going to go through some of those results and then even tell you about some uh, the newest stuff is, which is even this potential for even clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome. So it's really a very exciting avenue and area. Um, I would ask everybody if they could please mute themselves that would really help um so if you can do that um that really helps just so that for the feedback for everybody if that can be done i greatly appreciate that so thank you and dr Ances, yeah one more thing if everyone could put your name on your so that we could see so i can make sure that i'm sending out everything our thank yous and everything to everybody i see some ipad names but no, no real name. So if you could rename yourself, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. And there's also the chat box that's on the bottom. If you wanted to look that, if you had some questions that you were really pressing for you right now, you can type those in and then we'll, we'll talk about them. And then as McKinney was saying, 
I'm glad to answer a lot of your questions. I haven't gone for a full hour for slides or anything even close to that. So I wanted to make sure we could answer some of your questions as well. Okay, so this is what the outline is. So let's just talk about some facts and figures that we know uh, in particular for Down syndrome. So as, as many of you know, Down syndrome is the most common chromosomal disorder. Uh, it, is, uh, it also can cause intellectual disability. And what we know is that it's from a trisomy 21, meaning that it's the genetic disease where this third copy on chromosome 21. In the US, there's about 6,000 babies that are born with Down syndrome. So that's about one in 700. And as many of you also know, between the years of 70, 1979 and 2003, the number of babies born with Down syndrome has increased by about 30%. So overall, there's about one in 1,000 children and teenagers that are living in the U.S. with Down syndrome. And the life expectancy of individuals with Down syndrome has dramatically risen. So from the 1920s and 10s uh, to the age of about nine to now over 60 years of age that we're seeing many individuals with Down syndrome. And in fact, uh, yesterday in my clinic, I saw a 59-year-old uh, with, with Down syndrome. So very common that I'm seeing individuals now uh, getting older with Down syndrome, and that's because of improved health care lower infant mortality rates, and then also big shifts that we're starting to see. And what we're starting to realize is though that many individuals as they're growing older with Down syndrome, there's a higher prevalence of now uh, those individuals developing Alzheimer's disease. And so the whole link is, is that with Down syndrome and sporadic Alzheimer's disease is that on chromosome 21, that chromosome also has a lot of different proteins, meaning things that kind of are the basic building blocks that make us uh, who we are. And in particular, on that chromosome is something called the amyloid precursor protein, APP. Now this gene, because there's three copies of it, leads to an overproduction of amyloid. And what I'm showing you on the right-hand side are the pathology that we see with Alzheimer's disease. And in particular, uh, to make a definitive diagnosis of anybody with Alzheimer's disease, we look for these characteristic changes in amyloid, which are those red spots. I don't know if you can see my arrow, but these red spots, these plaques, amyloid plaques, and then within the neurons or the brain cells, there's this tau that gets deposited. And so the combination of this amyloid and tau allows us to make a definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And what we're, we know is, is that virtually all Down syndrome individuals will start to have this pathology. And really by the ages of 40 or over, they start having more of this deposits of amyloid within their brain. And so that by the time, by the age of 50 to 55 years of age, we know that almost half of individuals who have Down syndrome have symptomatic or who have some kinds of con uh, additional potential brain changes that will be characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. And why that's so important is that studies on Down syndrome can really help us understand the temporal progression, meaning the ch changes that occur in individuals and understand the pathology and provide us unique insights into the general population. So there is work that are done in other genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease, and that's something called autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease. And work that's being done here at WashU is really focusing on that. But in those individuals, it's very rare. And in fact, we have to go all around the world to kind of see what those kinds of changes are because there are very few individuals who have that. And as we presented in the previous slide, and we know that Down syndrome is much more common, um, this is another avenue for us to understand this pathogenesis and really understand what kinds of changes are occurring within individuals and kind of continually follow these individuals. So again, Down syndrome kind of provides us a model of Alzheimer's disease. And so there are three different forms and I'm showing you on the left-hand side of what we think of, of for Alzheimer's disease. There's something called sporadic Alzheimer's disease and that's the most typical form of Alzheimer's disease, meaning, as we get all older, we have an increased risk of developing this late onset Alzheimer's disease. Then there's this autosomal dominant ADAD, which is in those individuals who have a mutation 
and a genetic mutation, and then everybody in their family, there's a 50-50 chance. And if they do inherit that mutation, they will develop Alzheimer's disease. And that's something, again, called autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease. And then that third leg is the Down syndrome associated Alzheimer's disease. And what I'm trying to show you on the right-hand side is that if we have our understanding of what's happening in sporadic Alzheimer's disease, that can give us clues of what's occurring in autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease. And then clues from uh, Down syndrome Alzheimer's disease can allow us to understand what's occurring in sporadic. And then these two forms of these genetic forms of either Down syndrome associated Alzheimer's disease or autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease can each teach us also important lessons. And in fact, we're starting to notice that a lot of the changes that we see in autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease look very similar to Down syndrome associated Alzheimer's disease. Furthermore, because we know these individuals will develop the disease, is that if we understand here and as well as develop drugs that could potentially work for one of these two genetic forms, they may have important, important uh, features that could also help us with this either more late form of the disease, the sporadic or late onset Alzheimer's disease. And again, as I was trying to accentuate to you before in the previous slide, as we know, there's over 250,000 children, teens and adults living with Down syndrome in the United States and more than 6 million worldwide. This is much larger. So this Down syndrome, ADAD, swamps any of the individuals and numbers that we see with this autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease. So again, understanding what's occurring with Down syndrome associated Alzheimer's disease may have serious implications for, again, late onset, as well as this autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease. So how do we kind of, how can I say those kinds of results? How can I say, well, what is happening in these individuals? Like we were talking about some of the pathology that's going on in these individuals, but are there other ways to kind of evaluate individuals uh, for potential development of Alzheimer's disease? And the answer is in general, and specifically in the late onset Alzheimer's disease, we are really starting to develop these new biomarkers. And as I said to you in the bottom, we give a definition. These are biological markers that allow us to define a medical state of an individual, and then they can be reproduced repeatedly and more accurately. And then they can uh, kind of give us an indica uh, indication of a patient's condition and where they are in the spectrum of the disease. So these allow us to kind of follow an individual and see where, they're, where they lie in the disorder and allow us to do it non-invasively. Because as I said to you before in the beginning, you know, that pathology, well, we don't want to do a biopsy or don't want to make a diagnosis when an individual is passed. Can we make earlier diagnoses of, of individuals and see these kinds of changes? And so what I have on the left-hand side are ways to look at the spinal fluid, the cerebral spinal fluid. And on the right-hand side, some really new and exciting work of even looking at the blood. So first of all, why would we look at that idea of that spinal fluid? So where, where is it and what is it doing? So first of all, the spinal fluid is the fluid that kind of coats around our brain and all the way around our spinal cord. And it's kind of like this nice fluid cushion that helps protect us, okay? So when we're moving our heads and we're slashing our brain around, it's kind of that fluid that kind of allows us to move our brain around and not uh, constantly affect our brain cells and hurt our brain cells. Well, this fluid though is also kind of where all the, and I kind of use this literally, uh, trash or all the products from the brain can kind of deposit it and then get flushed away as we sleep and get replenished, okay? And so looking at the spinal fluid gives us an indirect way to look at those brain cells or what's occurring within the brain. And in particular, we could look at those two markers in the uh, of brain cell changes within the spinal fluid, one of them being, that, as I said to you before, amyloid, and the other one being tau. So naturally, even as we're speaking right here and you're kind of listening and we're talking today, we are naturally producing amyloid and tau. But typically, they kind of get produced and then they get kind of cleared away. But in individuals who develop Alzheimer's disease, there can be either too much production or too little clearance of those kinds of factors or these proteins that are developing. 
And in particular, if we think about that in amyloid, it's you got to think about this, put on your little caps for a second, and the spinal fluid. Well, amyloid, if we're all producing it and at a normal level, more of it's depositing in the brain, that means less of it's seeping out into the spinal fluid. So as a person becomes more and more impaired, their CSF, their spinal fluid amyloid will drop. And at the same time, as I was telling you before, we have this kind of idea that as amyloids changing in the brain, that affects the brain cells or those neurons, and they don't like it. And so they start leaking out this other factor that's within them, this other protein that's within them, and that's the tau. And so as a patient becomes more and more impaired and is developing Alzheimer's disease, their tau ratios will go up. So it's a kind of drop in amyloid and an increase in tau. And it's kind of this ratio of the two that allows us to define an individual if they're developing symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. And so what I have over on the left-hand side is some colleagues who've been looking at this in Spain, and they have either healthy controls, asymptomatic or ADS, prodromal, meaning that they're having very mild changes compared to their baseline of how they've been doing, or individuals who've had significant changes, dementia due to Down syndrome with the DDS. And you can start to see on that left-hand side that amyloid is dropping in the spinal fluid. At the same time, tau is starting to increase in the spinal fluid. So again, that ratio is occurring. So that spinal tap, that fluid that, that we do, it's the same kind of thing that we would do if you were having a baby, an epidural, where we would be numbing the back and then inserting a small needle into the back and taking the fluid. That fluid that we would be looking for allows us to make a kind of diagnosis of seeing what's changing in the brain. But what's really revolutionary, and I think is really gonna change our field and for everybody, irregardless, uh, who you are, if you're worried about Down syndrome, or I'm sorry, worried about Alzheimer's disease, that we're now going to start to have blood markers to make that diagnosis. So for guys, and I'm, I apologize for, I'm using the guy example here, but for prostates, you know, we can do a PSA and we can look at, is it elevated? Is that telling us that something is bad that's going on? So if we start thinking about that, we can start to look at very fine quantities in the plasma or in the blood of amyloid and tau, and then this other marker called neurofilament light. So we can look at these and they mark how much of the brain cells are being affected. And you can again see in these different populations, here's the controls, those asymptomatic Down syndrome, meaning they have no signs or symptoms, those prodromal or they're having mild cognitive symptoms uh, compared to their baseline, and those with dementia due to Down syndrome. You can start to see even within the plasma, just like in the CSF, there is already this increase in the plasma markers of tau. And again, these markers of brain cell function, neurofilament light, not the football league. It's the regular, uh, a different kind of measure that we're, we're looking at. So this is really, really exciting because now we now have ways to look at individuals and get a gross idea of what's happening in the brain. So that really tells us a lot more information than just alone the pen and paper. And that's why, and you'll see this later on in the studies that we're gonna be conducting here and that we've already started conducting here, we're getting both these spinal fluid measurements and these blood measurements. So that's great, but I'm going to give you a little story of, of myself. And um, the answer is, is that when you ever look for real estate and where I used to live in San Diego, it was always the question of location, location, location. And so, as I told you before, that blood and the spinal fluid kind of give us a marker of grossly what's happening in the brain, but they can't tell us what single area or what areas are changing within the brain. However, we have an ability to do that. And some of you have already participated and done some of these kinds of studies of where we can actually look at the brain non-invasively. Well, one way to look at it is something called an MRI or magnetic resonance imaging. And what we do is we stick you in that tube and it's pretty easy and you just stay still for about 45 minutes to an hour and we take pretty pictures of your brain and we can look at what are the changes within the brain. But then we can also look at, again, that measures of amyloid or tau, we can look at them. 
And so what we have been able to make is do something called a radio tracer. So we can tag something and inject it into the arm and wait to see if there's an increase in uptake of this tagged molecule, which we can then measure using this positron emission tomography. It's very, very safe. It's a radioisotope, so everybody goes, oh my gosh, am I gonna light up or anything? And the answer is no. And you pee it all out. By the time you leave the scanner, you're already, uh, uh, the half-lives have already been cleared. And the point of it is, is that it allows us, we can make a tag to look at either the amyloid or the tau changes within the brain. And so what we do is we uh, have an IV in an individual, we inject, we wait a period of time, and then we take those pretty pictures, and then we try to see, is there an increase in uptake, as you can see here, of this amyloid or tau within an individual. So these are now two ways to look at where those changes are occurring, not just if those changes are occurring, but again, where those changes are occurring. So what do we see in individuals with uh, Down syndrome who have Alzheimer's disease. So one is that MRI allows us to see volumes or how big or small areas of the brain are. And as you can see, as these areas get more and more of these changes in blue to greater and greater changes, these are areas where there is significant atrophy or shrinking of the brain. And what you see is, is that there is atrophy again, in the back of the brain, as well as the front of the brain. So what this is, is a cut. So as if you were looking uh, cross-sectional on an individual, this is the back of the brain, this is the front of the brain, this is what we call the temples of the brain, and this is the top of the brain, so this is the top. And as we're looking in the back, in the, in the middle of the back of the brain, we see large atrophy that's occurring, but then we also see some atrophy in the front of the brain. And if I actually took off this image and showed you an Alzheimer's disease uh, for what do we see with atrophy, it's in very similar areas. But not all the areas of the brain are actually affected. Some areas you see are in gray where there's no changes that seem to be occurring. And then we also can do something called metabolism. So we can inject one of those radioisotopes and we can try to see if there is an increase in brain function or how the brain cells are functioning. Now, we use the same kind of tracer if individuals were to have cancer, and we'd see if there's an increase in uptake, and we use that same kind of tracer to try to see if there's an increase in uptake or a decrease in uptake. And again, the blue values all are lower uh, metabolism, and you can start to see that how the brain cells are functioning nicely correlates with areas that are shrinking in the brain. They look very, very similar, these two images. Okay. So that's now we know that brain cells and how they're functioning are going to be affected. But what about one of those hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, amyloid? Is there an increase of amyloid deposition with Down syndrome? And all the areas in red are areas where there's an increase in amyloid and where the highest amounts of amyloid are in yellow. And again, we start to see is that there's a large amount of amyloid throughout the brain and the highest amounts of amyloid are in the same spots where there's the lowest metabolism and the biggest amount of atrophy. So we're starting to see this kind of link where there is amyloid changes that are then leading to metabolism changes that are then leading to brain cells kind of shrinking. And again, what we see in these changes in Down syndrome in AD, if I put up pictures of either sporadic Alzheimer's disease, late onset, that, that late onset form or autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, we would see similar kinds of pictures in these kinds of individuals as well. So again, it nicely shows that these different models are all helping us understand what's occurring in Alzheimer's disease. So how do we link all of that together? Well, there is now these ideas that are occurring that these changes in amyloid and tau and all these other measures are a slowly progressive process. So what does that mean? So when I see an individual who has Alzheimer's disease, if it's due to Down syndrome or autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease or late onset Alzheimer's disease, it wasn't yesterday you had did not have Down syndrome and today you did have Down syndrome. I'm sorry, yesterday you did not have Alzheimer's disease and today you did have Alzheimer's disease. It is actually, it is a slowly progressive process, meaning that it probably takes 
10 to 15 to almost 20 years for these kinds of changes to really be occurring in individuals. And in particular, we think that these changes occur with amyloid occurring first, then tau, those other biomarker of the disease, then those volumes, so the shrinkage of the brain, and then these eventual cognitive impairment. So here is an individual with years. So this would be age zero all the way to age 70. And then this is biomarker abnormality. So this is normal. And then these are abnormal, the more abnormal an individual is. And so what we're looking at is above this kind of threshold or this level is that we would say an individual was positive, meaning that they have an over amount or over too much of, a, of, a, of this kind of factor. And what you're starting to see is that in amyloid and also uh, in Down syndrome, already by the age of 10, it's starting to rise by age of 20 and by the ages of 30, it's already pretty high. And definitely by the ages of 40, it's pretty elevated in individuals with Down syndrome. With tau, this other marker of the disease, it's already starting to rise, but it's starting to rise later on. So by the time an individual is positive for amyloid, say at age 20, it takes them to be positive for tau by age 30 or by age 40 years of age. And so by the time an individual then develops these cognitive changes, it's much later on in the disease process. And so we can then use these kinds of ways to kind of stage where an individual is in regards to pathology of the disease and kind of evaluate them. And we use this criteria, the ATN, this amyloid, tau, and neurodegeneration to kind of stage where an individual is. And these kinds of curves that I'm showing you here are very similar to the kinds of curves that we think of, of what's happening with late onset Alzheimer's disease. And this idea is, is that you may have been reading it or when you Google stuff and you see this, is that there's this kind of idea of this amyloid hypothesis. So changes in amyloid are occurring first. Those changes in amyloid that are being made that we're naturally producing, somehow there's too much of it being deposited. That affects the brain cells and the neurons. Those neurons don't fire as well and they start depositing more of this tau. Because the neurons are depositing more of the tau, then those brain cells shrink and some of them die off and that leads to neurodegeneration. And by the time you have all of these factors, that then leads to, because there's less cognitive reserve eventually, to cognitive impairments where people are then coming in saying, I can't do these things, I can't remember as well, I'm having harder problems uh, doing certain kinds of tasks. So how does that relate to all of us? Well, I'm really excited to tell you, and we just had the announcement uh, two days ago, that we're actually, uh, WashU is going to be one of the sites to look at Alzheimer's disease in Down syndrome. Now, we've already been doing that, and we've been doing it in one study, and this new study is going to continue on that work for the next five years, and we're going to be following individuals with Down syndrome across the spectrum of ages and do those kinds of tests that I just mentioned to you before and kind of trying to understand those timelines within down syndrome. Because if we understand that, as I was telling you before, that can have relationships with the other genetic form of Alzheimer's disease, as well as the more common form, this late onset Alzheimer's disease. So the objectives of this new study uh, that is actively going on is it's called the Alzheimer's Biomarker Consortium for Down Syndrome. It's, we like to use acronyms because always in medical things and come up with cool names. No, Michael Jackson's not going to be singing right now, but it is ABC slash or uh, hyphen DS. So uh, Alzheimer's Biomarker Consortium for Down Syndrome. So what we're going to be doing is setting up this organizational infrastructure to follow and comprehensively characterize a large cohort of individuals who are above the ages of 25 years of age who have Down syndrome. And we're gonna be looking at those biomarkers that I was just mentioning that look at that amyloid, that tau and that neurodegeneration, and then also understand if there are other risk factors. So as we know, in individuals with Down syndrome, they may have cardiac issues and they may have lung issues and they may have thyroid issues. And the question is, does that change when those curves occur or does that move things earlier or later? And we wanna look at those kinds of risks and if they're modified by select factors. Then we're gonna be also looking at genetic factors because it's not just that amyloid precursor protein that's on chromosome 21. There are other proteins that could also be important that can also lead to Alzheimer's disease. 
And then the idea is, is that in many of these individuals, if we have them well characterized, they would be uh, have the opportunity in the future to be ready for potential clinical trials. And I'll talk to you about that as well. And then we'll, of course, make all this data available. I mean, it will be de-identified, so nobody will know who those individuals are. But if they also want to study the pictures of the brain, if they also want to study some of these blood markers, they can also uh, learn more about the disease. So this is it's really a huge collaborative effort across many institutions, and I'll show you that for a second. But I just wanted to kind of give you pictures of some of the, the leaders. So this is Dr. Christian, Dr. Head, Dr. Mapstone, and Dr. Handen. And then in green are all the people here at WashU that are actively involved in this. And then this is your tax dollar. So this is all being funded through NIH, uh, so the National Institute of Health to kind of study this. So this is going to be the largest study in the United States and if not in the world to look at this relationship between Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome. And what's so unique is, is that it's in our own backyard and we're very, 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 very fortunate uh, to be able to be participating in this and offer these kinds of resources to our community. So in red are all the clinical research centers and in blue are all the where research is just being done. And I've circled for us in green that we are both doing clinical as well as research. And what's so unique here is that here's St. Louis, the next closest is in Wisconsin or in kind of uh, Pennsylvania and in uh, Kentucky. The next closest south is we send some labs to uh, Texas, but we're the most southern kind of site. And then the most western site, the next closest is our buddies in California. It didn't really actually come out as well, but trust me, it's in California. It's not in uh, Arizona or Nevada there. Um, but uh, the point is, is that you can start to see these are all the different sites, but it's not just us in the United States. It's even some colleagues in the UK, so at Cambridge. And we are all doing the clinical kinds of characterization of individuals. And then our site is one of those few sites that's also doing the research side of this. And so really, this is a unique opportunity that we have for the St. Louis community to really be involved in this, as well as give everybody more information of what's going on. So what are we going to be doing in this kind of study? So we're gonna be getting some demographics and looking at the health history of individuals. We're gonna be talking to family members or other people who know those individuals very well and get caregiver reports and how, they're, how much of their capacity, their mood, their behavior changes. We're gonna do some simple pen and paper tests, okay? So we're gonna be looking at different, we call them domains or how the thinking is in the memory component or executive functioning, meaning planning for different kinds of events, visual spatial, meaning how things are organized in, in, in their vision and how well they can interpret that, their language capabilities, their movements, um, and how well they're doing stuff. And then all of them are going to be, all these individuals will have a physical exam and a neurological exam. Here, it'll be performed by years truly. Um, and we'll be looking at how their balances, their gait, their motor movements are. And then we'll be taking a little bit of blood from all these individuals because we told you about some of those new cool new markers that are going to be looked at. But we'll also be looking at other kinds of markers of inflammation. And then we're going to be taking, as I told you before, pictures of the brain, the MRI. And we're looking at different ways of how the brain is connected or the volumes of those areas or blood flow to the brain. Then we're going to be looking at those PET markers that I also told you about. So that's going to be looking at the amyloid and tau, um, those two PET markers. And then for people who are interested, you know, this is not a requirement of the study, but we, of course, encourage individuals. We'll be also looking and doing a spinal tap and looking at that amyloid and tau and those other measurements that we think are very important for an early diagnosis. And then if individuals were to pass, um, to look if, there, if the families are willing to do this is to donate the brain so that we can then stage individuals and see what's happened to them. And so as you can start to see is that this will give us a very, very comprehensive picture of an individual and how they're progressing with the disease. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to be following individuals at month zero, 16 months, 32 months, and 48 months. And then these are the different things. So in blue, or all the kind of pen and paper stuff. 
and in orange are all the physical exam stuff, in white are all the blood draws, then in yellow are the MRIs, and then the green are the PET studies, either the amyloid or tau or the, or the FDG PET. And then we'll also be meeting a clinical conference. So all of us kind of discussing, taking all of this information, what is the stage of an individual? And so we'll be bringing them back every 16 months to evaluate and see the trajectory of that individual. The goal is, is that we would be able to create an individual trajectory for an individual, but we would also be able to do it on a group level and seeing how people are changing at different ages and kind of get more of those smoother curves of what's going on in individuals. So there is a high point of this as well that we need to become much more uh, facile and in working with large communities of individuals. And I would say, and I apologize to you, is that what we have not been able to do as well is look at underrepresented groups, and particularly in African Americans. Um, that has not been well studied, and we need to understand that because we need to provide to these communities what the changes are and if there are differences or not. So we've seen that improvements in mortality and increased survival of Down syndrome over all the past decade has been seen in all, the, in all races, but that effect has been less in the African American community. In particular, there are significant differences in the reported life expectancies with Caucasians living into the 50s and 60s compared to African Americans living at almost half. And that's very disturbing and very concerning. And the question is why and how can we improve that? And so we really need to, and we are actively working with many of you and others to really make sure that we are as inclusive as possible and in particular focusing on underrepresented communities to make sure that we understand what are the differences or similarities within different races. So most importantly, most recent studies have shown that there are potentially some differences in AD pathology according to race. And so as part of our group and as a part of the overall general consensus of this overall ABCDS, we will have an Alzheimer's disease, Down syndrome outreach recruitment and edu education core, which will be focusing on recruiting underrepresented communities and developing material for education and recruitment. So we're actively doing that and we would love and encourage anybody and everyone to please participate in this because we think that this is going to be very important for us in understanding the disease and giving back information to everybody. So some of you may know a picture of somebody here and we thank them for it. And they're showing the number one being our first participant. Here are the general characteristics of the individuals that have been followed so far in the uh, previous studies. So the ABCDS was to a conglomeration of two other studies that have been done in the past and now they've been combined into one. Overall, there's been about 550 individuals that have been followed in the past, some coming from here, and then we will be making a major effort to increase that number to over 600 and some individuals, with a lot of those in additional individuals being recruited from here at, at WashU. You can see the different breakdowns of the ages, the race, with 96%, as I was saying to you before, being Caucasian or white. And then their status of how many are stable, how many are having this mild cognitive impairment, how many having uh, dementia, and then how many are being undetermined because we can't figure out from the first time point, but then by following them repeatedly, we can start to classify an individual. We can see those other cofactors that can be very important of if there's thyroid problems or seizures or strokes or obesity. And then in genetic risk factors, we said that, of course, having three copies may be effect, but this apolipoprotein E or ApoE allele that could also influence the development of Alzheimer's disease. And we see that it's about 17% and we're looking at those genetic factors. But we're not just looking at those individuals, the Down syndrome individuals by themselves. There is a component of also following simply controls who do not have Down syndrome. And we're continuing to follow these individuals in the future. And you can see there's gonna be at least 10 more with a lot coming from our site to fill in that role of the sibling controls as well. So if you wanted to know, I've just listed all of the different neuropsych tests that are there so that you can have that at your disposal. You can see that it does take a little while for us to do this. It takes a couple hours, but it's 
Uh, most of our participants have really loved it. It's really cool games. I like playing some of these games, um, especially the hand movements and gestures moves and some other things. They're really fun things to be doing. Um, and we give lots of people breaks uh, during this. Um, and then these are just some of the kinds of tests by looking at them, we can start to see that people who are cognitively stable versus MCI versus those that have Alzheimer's disease, um, you can start to see that there's this gradual stepwise decrease in how well they're doing on these different tests. And then how well they remember a certain task, you can start to see that the scores can also change as well. Those that are cognitively stable have the best scores. So the combination of the free, meaning that how many they can be totally remember off the, uh, off the top of their head versus those that are cued, we give them a little tips or a little extra clues. And then the total is the combination of the two. You can see those that are cognitively stable score the best. Those that have MCI have a little bit of a decrease and those that have uh, dementia have the, the lowest or the worst scores. And so we can use these kinds of tests to also kind of grade where an individual is in the overall spectrum of the disease progression. We can also use that and compare that to how they're doing with the PET imaging. So this is just to show you that in individuals that are cognitively normal, sorry, that are cognitively stable uh, and that do not have any amyloid changes, most of these individuals are flatline, meaning that they don't change in their neuropsych and their PET scans kind of stay similar. Those people that start to convert, you can start to see that they're starting to drop off. And those people who are positive, meaning that they already have a large amount of amyloid, they're already continuing to drop in their score. So the presence of this amyloid, uh, as they're starting to develop more and more of that amyloid, that's affecting how well they're doing on many of these neuropsych scores. We also asked the caregiver large amounts. So while we're, we're testing one of the individuals, we also have uh, the caregiver, parents, or others that know the individual very well. They're also filling out some forms. And uh, that has allowed us, plus the imaging, to kind of get a, a very good sense of where an individual stands. And why that's going to be important is that when we have these fancy dancy covers of different journals, we like to put those pretty pictures on them. And the idea is, is that can we develop agents that are potential for targeting that amyloid? And if we suck up that amyloid, could that make a difference? And so there are now clinical trials. There's a phase 1B, meaning just to test the safety uh, and efficacy of this drug in Down syndrome. Uh, and the idea would be that uh, in the future, any of these anti-amyloid therapies could be considered for individuals with Down syndrome. And the idea would be that if we now can stage an individual, know where they are in the spectrum of the progression, we would then be able to do a clinical trial and those individuals could be eligible for those kinds of clinical trials. And so that's what part of this uh, study is to do. And then there are gonna be some clinical trials that are also gonna be run out of WashU uh, through USC and others that are gonna be evaluating different agents. So really this is a really exciting time because we will now be able to characterize and then potentially offer therapies to individuals uh, with Down syndrome, which is unheard of and I can't, uh, wait to see this and really work with uh, numbers of people who are interested in possibly going down this road in the future. So in conclusion, I know I've talked for a little bit. Uh, I hope I haven't bored you that much for the last 40 minutes or so. Of what we do know is that Down syndrome is a form that is genetically determined Alzheimer's disease. We think that it's a great model for us to understand those changes in that amyloid and tau and neurodegeneration and that we can start to characterize individuals with Down syndrome using these biomarkers. And that by doing that and characterizing and staging these individuals, we may have preventative trials for uh, Alzheimer's disease, and that may then translate to individuals with Down syndrome and having a trial-ready cohort uh, for both following as well as for potential therapies in the future. Well, I wouldn't be able to do it here. I'm just the kind of mouthpiece for a really strong group that I'm very fortunate enough to work with. Here are a large number of members of our lab, but I really wanted to say uh, we're really 
greatly appreciative of all the work and all the hard work that both the participants and their caregivers do. We wouldn't really be here. And it's just a great team effort. And we're very excited to work with you. And then here are two people, Olga, who's on, uh, as well as Liz, and their contact information. If this is something that interests you, if this is something that you may know other friends of yours that are very interested in, please, please, please uh, contact us. We'll be glad to uh, try to see if you would be could be eligible for this. Um, and more importantly, we really want to work with everybody here and want to offer this unique resource to everybody. As a side note, I would just say is that irregardless of individuals, if they are, if they want to be in these kinds of studies or not, myself and a colleague of mine who's in the Department of Psychiatry, John Constantino, who's a world leader in uh, child psychiatry, we are both having clinics where we're seeing uh, Down syndrome individuals and we're evaluating them both for neurological, meaning cognitive or thinking problems or neuropathy and or if they're having psychiatric uh, or changes in their personality or in their mood, he's seeing those individuals. And then we have a consensus conference once a month. And we're probably one of the only places in the United States that's offering that. And so I am seeing, and yesterday I saw Down syndrome, as I was telling you before, I'm actively seeing these individuals. If you have questions, if you want us to be evaluated, we are glad to also offer those services because we know there's been a large gap and I apologize for that. And we want to try to fill that gap and work with you. And we want to provide those kinds of services to you because our expectation is, is that we know that as we start building this, there will be even more that will start to be coming out of the woodwork. And we want to help as many people as we can. So with that, I'll stop sharing and uh, go from there. Um, uh, and I'm glad to take any questions that you may have. So thank you. There's also a couple of our um, former participants that are on with their folks today. So if you guys have any questions um, for them, they said they'd be willing to, to answer any questions and kind of give you their perspective on, on the study too, so. So I'll start with some of the questions that are listed here and then we can go on to other ones. So one was, at what age do you typically see signs of Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome? And the answer is, it's very variable, but on average, uh, we start seeing the hallmarks of, of Alzheimer's disease by the age of 40. Um, but that doesn't mean some individuals may develop it later and some individuals may develop it at a younger age. And so there's a lot of variability and we don't know why that variability occurs. And that's why we're also doing some of these kinds of studies to try to answer and figure out what, why that's occurring. The next question was, and that's a great question uh, there. Kathy was asking a question of sporadic Alzheimer's disease. That's the late onset Alzheimer's disease, meaning that's occurring usually in the ages of 70 or 80 years old. So he or she above gave us a brain for a period of time, but as we start getting older, we develop more and more of these plaques where we can't clear them. And because of that, by the age of 80, about 40% of the population already has the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease by the age of 90, over 50% of the population. If you get to be the age of 100, most of those individuals, now they may not show the signs, they may, but they will have the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the next question was, did the number or the percent increase, did the number or the percent increase how does the plaque development in Down syndrome compare to the general public? Can you screen for Down syndrome AD? So there, I'm not sure, did the number or the percent yeah. increase? I was sorry. talking about, you said the number of people with Down syndrome increased. And obviously as the population grows, the number would, but I was wondering if the percentage of kids with Down syndrome is increasing. You said from 1975 to 2004, whatever it was, yeah. Right, so the, What's happening is because of healthcare in general, and because we are now being able to make better treatments for cardiac or for lung issues or for the other comorbidities that are typically uh, have been affecting individuals that could have led to their demise. Now, individuals are living much longer. Um, Down syndrome individuals are living 
much longer and very productive lives. But because of that, they're getting older. So there's just going to be this larger increase that we're going to be seeing. It's the same kind of increase that we see with individuals in the general population, right? We have better health care. We have better access to stuff. So individuals are living longer. So we're seeing now more and more individuals developing this sporadic or late onset Alzheimer's disease. It's the same thing that we're seeing in the Down syndrome community. Um, in the particular for the plaque development, that's a really good, that was a, that's a, that's a, I didn't talk about that, but that's a really good question. Um, so the plaques that are formed in um, Down syndrome look similar, but are not exactly the same as of right now to the plaques that we see in, um, uh, in the sporadic Alzheimer's disease. So there are these more diffuse plaques that start to accumulate more right. in Down syndrome. Down syndrome, and then it does form these neuritic plaques, but it's more of the diffuse first before it forms these neuritic. I'm getting now a little technical for you there, um, but they're just different kinds of plaques that, yeah. that are going. And then it says, can you screen for Down syndrome? Uh, for well, AD that was Down before you discussed it. Oh, so you sorry. Great. Yeah. All right. I did answer your question there. Good. Yeah. Um, and then what parts of the brain are most affected? Oh, so as I'm showing you to the back part of the brain um, that's affected, and um, we see a little differences in Down syndrome and in um, autosomal dominant, the other form of genetic Alzheimer's disease compared to late onset. So in late onset, those people, as we get older, uh, who develop Alzheimer's disease, it's a lot in the temporal area, some area called the hippocampus, which is involved in short-term memory. And what I'm doing is just pushing right on my temple. So if you did that same thing and we were to drill, I would never encourage anybody doing this, but if you were to drill down in those areas, that would be where you'd hit the hippocampus of the brain. And in those areas, we start to see large changes in Alzheimer's disease and late onset Alzheimer's disease. In contrast, we see more in the back part of the brain and a little bit more in the front part of the brain, which are seen in Down syndrome. And so what does that mean? So the front part of the brain is involved in this executive functioning, meaning planning of events. And the back part of the brain is a lot more in the visual spatial, but that doesn't mean that everybody will have the same kinds of signs and symptoms because in different people, different things kind of pop up of what's, what's happening to them. So uh, I hope that answered your question on the areas most affected. And then the, and one other thing that I would also say is another area of the brain that we see that's a, a, where there are changes more in Down syndrome are in these very deep areas called the basal ganglia that really control movement. But we don't usually see a lot of movement disorders in individuals who have Down syndrome, especially older individuals with Down syndrome. But there is a lot of amyloid in those very deep areas of the brain. So those seem to be uh, deposited more in the genetic forms compared to the late onset. Monica asked uh, the neuroimaging slide, does the darker color show worse atrophy? Yes, the, well, no, is the lighter color, the lighter blue show worse atrophy and lighter color shows less atrophy, it's the reverse. The dark blue is some atrophy, the lighter the blue uh, is more atrophy on, that, on, those, on those figures. And then has the dual diagnosis with autism been identified as any interaction? And the answer is, I don't know. And that's what we're also looking at. Are there other, um, conditions that are kind of accelerating the process or not. We don't know them. Uh, we don't know. And hopefully by having a large enough sample of people who are being followed, we'll be able to have enough numbers to start teasing that out and trying to figure if that's the case or not. Did that help? Or are there more questions? I'm glad to answer them. People can come off of mute and ask their questions. I, I'd like to ask a question, please. Sure. Uh, so how close are you to starting these like anti-amyloid clinical trials? Like would this be at the end of the large scale research study? And then as a side question, uh, also I'm a, by the way, I'm a second year undergrad at WashU. I just have a brother at the room. That's how I got in here. <laughs> but uh, what research is available for our undergrads currently? <laughs> sure. So well, let's Bye. tackle the... Let, let's tackle. I'm so great. Uh, uh, thank you, Ari, for joining in and, 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 and being interested. So, so number one, let's talk about the clinical trial. So there, um, we are getting, uh, there is going to be individuals who are into this ABCDS. 
They will be offered if they want to be involved in clinical trials, uh, they have that opportunity to do that, but there's also gonna be a separate clinical trial and some people may want to be in the clinical trial and not in the observational trial, or some people may want to just be in the observational and not have medications. And so the answer is there's going to be a lot of options to individuals. Right now, the clinical trial is not up yet and running, but there will be in the near future. We don't know the exact dates yet. Um, we also don't even know which uh, drug is going to be given yet. Um, so we're still trying to figure that out. Um, but we're trying to use the information from those other genetic studies. So we talked to you about that autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease. So that's already been doing work in clinical trials and evaluating some therapies. And so we're going to try to use information from that study to try to understand what is the best drug to choose as well as the best dosage. And so as a side note, in those studies, they figured out that they probably didn't give a high enough dosage of the drug. And so now they're doing an open label investigation where they're giving a higher dose of the drug. And if they're seeing that that works, that may influence which drug we would do in a clinical trial, but we're not there yet. So uh, give us a little time, um, but that will be an option. I think that will definitely be an option in the years to come, but I don't know when exactly. I, I, I don't want to say also, oh, in the next year, and then you come back to me, Harry, and say, you told me it was this date, and I, I don't want to give you any dates. I can't, I can't make any promises for you on that. As for undergrads, we're always interested. Um, uh, it's it's kind of tough for um, undergrads right now um, because of COVID-19 and coming into labs and doing some of that stuff uh, of how much space is open. Uh, usually it's a little bit easier uh, pre-COVID as McKinney was talking about before versus post-COVID um, and looking forward to that. But the same point I would say to you is the biggest, the best time that we usually see for undergrads working with us is over the summer. And there are a lot of different research options to work in different labs. And you know, you're welcome to contact us and talk to us about those opportunities. We're always looking for that. And as well as you also heard Liz saying this, we're actively trying to look, and we've also been talking with Thomas and others of trying to have ambassadors that are also gonna be working with our study. So people who've gone through this study and understand it, and have been a participant who can then also be walking through uh, another participant who would be interested in that and say, hey, I went through this. It takes, I can say that because uh, I've been in a scanner, I have had a lot of these tests, I've had blood tests and I've done a lot of the LPs, but it means nothing of what I say. It means a lot more of an individual who's actually gone through this, who then says, look, I did this, this is what happened to me. These are the things, these are tricks, these are other kinds of things. So we're, we're actively looking to try to incorporate that and figure out ways to make sure that the community is actively involved. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Dan? I'll definitely keep in touch with you over sure. email. No problem. McKinney, you had a question. Yeah, well, what I wanted to ask, I want to ask one question, but before I do, I was just wondering if we could have, if the participants that have already gone through the program would like to like have like a couple of minutes worth of saying something to us, so we would just kind of get a feel for what was going on. Carly or, hi, Andrew, uh, you guys, hey, Mr. Suleman, how you doing? Um, <laughs> so either, either of you guys want to say something? Yeah, you can. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, remember me? Hi, Carl. I do, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know how I get on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was amazing. It was. It was amazing for me. It's, it's, kind of new, it's kind of new to me, but I love it. All right. Thank you, Carly. Awesome. You're, uh, very kind words. Very kind words. <laughs> very eloquent. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Ms. Sulman, you want to say anything, Andrew? Uh, uh, well, first of all, I, uh, I want to thank everybody, but, and I would encourage yeah. anybody who's listening uh, to participate because, uh, number one, I'm going to let Andrew tell you how, how he feels, but it, uh, it was very convenient. Everything they could do to make it convenient for me, they did. Uh, but uh, I don't think Andrew had a problem um, at all with this, and it, the long-term effects of this is is too it's too great to be ignored. So, Andrew, did, do you have any problems with uh, with 
the test and so forth. No, oh, I, I, I love it. <laughs> he loved it. I do a lot. So thank you so much for me out. Well, thank you for saying that too. We loved having you too. We, we really, it's been a blast. It, it, we have so much fun with everybody here. It is such, I, I, I'm so bummed. I'm gonna be very honest with you. Well, COVID really sucks because I can't give people high fives or hugs. Okay? <laughs> I know. Because yeah. I really miss doing that. And it is so much fun having all everybody in. It's just been absolutely wonderful. Really, really. Thank you guys for both saying that. That's very kind words. Yeah, yeah. It's a great team we also work with, with Olga and Liz and everybody. You can see we're very <laughs> interested and very concerned. They, they are really great people to work oh, with. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Well, the one question I was going to ask, and then we've got a couple, and this might help because I, I, I know Debbie and I saw Donna, but during the pandemic, since the pandemic has started, some of our guys have been showing some honest to goodness regression. Yes. Is there yes. anything that we as family members, caregivers, everybody in our community can be doing to help? That goes along with the second part of my question is, like we all, as we get older, we keep hearing do crossword puzzles, do this, do that to help stave off Alzheimer's. Are there other things that we should be doing for our family members with Down syndrome in this same area? Oh wow, that's a that's a good one. I I I really need your opinion on this. Hello, I'm Donna Tazarek. Um, my sister Mary is 50 years old and has worked in society her whole life and extremely advanced and amazing. But she has not worked since February. And I work at Mercy Hospital. I work a lot of hours and there's no one to be here with her all the time. So I've kind of ran out of things to keep her mind functioning the way it used to before COVID. She's very smart, but I just want, I thank you for addressing this, McKinney. I just want to know from your perspective, is there anything in particular that I could have her do by herself when I'm not home? So she, because she's, her cognitive memory has just really regressed in front of me and in front of our family and friends. So I don't want to fail with what I could be doing now differently if there's something I could do differently for her. I, I hear you out and you're, you're, you're not alone, first of all. Uh, this is, uh, I have had a number of conversations and I've seen a number of patients who've had regressions. Um, it is very tough in COVID uh, times, but it's even tougher for uh, specifically for Down syndrome because yeah. the real community environment and that interaction that is so vital yeah. for many individuals is not able to be done. And yeah. so because of that, those connections and those activities and having a regimented kind of schedule and doing those right. kinds of things are being lost. And so, and it really falls upon a single right. caregiver or another family member or somebody else who knows them to try to do things and try to piece things together. I, it, it is definitely, I, I acknowledge that. And I think that that's a very important feature that we need to think about carefully. Um, are there ways, What first of all, so are there ways to do stuff at home and do those kinds of things? Um, the answer is yes. Um, I would encourage them to do kind of interactive kinds of things. So we still have this Zoom and if they can mm -hmm. do Zoom or somebody yeah. can be and they can be with other members that they feel comfortable with, I would encourage that. I would encourage kind of still kind of going into schedules of doing other kinds of things. So some of our patients, you were mentioning crossword puzzles or other kinds of things. If there are certain kinds of activities they like to do, I would still encourage them to do that as well as I would actually encourage them to be very physically active. So I will give you a personal experience of mine that has done is that both my wife and I actually go every night and we do a walk and I would encourage people to even just go out walking and doing those kinds mm -hmm. of things, get some mental as well as physical exercise and doing that. It can be do wonders. Now it's gonna be tough right now because the weather's getting colder and it's gonna be harder to get out and do those kinds of things. But we need to think about ways that can be in a structured environment 
where individuals mm -hmm. can kind of have that interaction, but then they are still masked and still doing these kinds of things. I've encouraged, like for my kids, I do the same kind of thing as even encouraging kids to go out or encouraging other people to meet out in a park and mm -hmm. find yeah. open spaces and do these kinds yeah. of things. So I, I, I definitely think that that kind of interaction has to be promoted and uh, figuring out, but it takes a lot of work and it's very hard because you're, as you, you know, you brought up, you're working and you're trying to do this and you're managing 16 different things. And then you also have to take care of numerous other tasks uh, alone. So it, it is a very hard thing to, 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 to juggle. I, I, she I and just one more thing she used to do her word search just perfect i mean she does jigsaw puzzles just she could put a 500 piece jigsaw puzzle together in like two days and she used to do word search just perfect like uh, hard word search and now she's just circling letters and not even words and well that may mean that she also may need to be and i'm again uh, i'm here and myself and Dr. Constantino were here to evaluate. There may be yeah. also some mood changes that are going on because mm -hmm. a lot of our a, a lot of our participants are experiencing this loneliness as you're you're so eloquently bringing this out. And there may be other things that may be able to be done. And if it's really a significant mood issues, there are some medications that, that can be given if needed. But I think those kinds of evaluations uh, need to be done in a clinical setting. Sure. Dr. Constantino and myself. And, okay. Dana, and we're glad to see those patients. Forget about the study. I'm not here for the study. Right, I'm right. For, for, yeah. for, for care. Liz, you had a comment or a question? And I know Thank Debbie you. also had something. No problem. I had, yeah, so I had two comments. So um, one of your recommendations, Dr. Ansis, was to have like more physical activity. McKinney, don't you do like videos every day or every other day, like workout videos for people? Or yeah, something? you're in daughter, right. That's an awesome, I love, I love Wacky Nose and I think that's a great thing. So if people aren't aware of that, hook up with McKinney because she's like Thank an you. excellent trainer. <laughs> <laughs> And then my, my other comment was, um, you know, Dr. saying that this is not an uncommon thing with, um, with folks that have Down syndrome. And it's so common, you know, with the whole COVID thing is that we actually have kind of a side, um, a side study that we're doing that's looking at the effects of COVID in folks that have Down syndrome. It's over, oh. uh, remind me, four sites, 12, five? Four sites, uh, four, four sites. sites. Um, and it's, well, the, remind me how long it is, an hour maybe of an interview? 30 to 45 minutes 40, over okay. the phone. Over the phone. So we can now. So it's very common. People are having all the same issues. You're very interested in seeing, you know, seeing what's going on. So if anyone is interested in doing that, completely separate from you know, all the PET scans and MRIs and everything like that, that's also something that um, you, know, you can contribute to if you're, if you're interested. Yeah, thank you. Okay. We, we need to get this out more because I don't think people appreciate that enough. And it's it's very important. And I'm so glad McKinney and Donna and others, you're willing to say this and voice these kinds of thoughts because um, I don't know an, if enough on the medical side or other kinds of sides know enough about this. And I, I think it's it's very important because um, I'm very worried about those, these, the long-term consequences of this. Yeah, me too. Don't forget, I'm not, this is not COVID. What, I, what I've said in, in other diseases that we're seeing it as well, it's not, the, it's not the direct COVID effects, it's the bystander effects. It's the secondary bystander because individuals mm -hmm. with Down syndrome may not be developing COVID, but because of all the precautions and everything that we do need to do, there are a lot of secondary consequences that are developing because of this. And so you're absolutely right. So thank you, thank you for bringing that out. Debbie, you, Bo, yes, please oh, go. So as I say, I just one thing to add to that, Bo. Um, the Alzheimer's Association is also a great resource, um, and we have a wonderful um, Alzheimer's Association chapter here in St. Louis. Um, so the <laughs> Alzheimer's Association of Greater Missouri, um, they have resources uh, not only for those with the uh, Alzheimer's disease, as far as different activities and things that they can do, but also for caregivers. Um, and, you know, if you go um, on their website, uh, www.alz.org, um, you can find the local chapter. Um, and I've been doing a little bit more of uh, reaching out to the local chapter and trying to raise more awareness uh, about individuals with Down syndrome. Um, and they're becoming more aware of it. Um, but, you know, one of the things that they are a resource for, like I said, is, is for caregivers. Um, and it's a great resource to be able to kind of just talk to someone. I think they have a, I think it's a 24 seven hour hotline. 
that you can call um, to just kind of discuss, you know, any uh, situations that you may be going through and they can kind of help help out. Um, so that's another uh, a great resource that can that can be tapped into as well. Debbie, you had a comment or a question, please. I have one. And then Monica, I know you have one too. Um, as far as my, my comment, my son, Jimmy, he's 30. He did do a wash you study or participated in one about three or four years ago. I can't remember exactly when it was. And I really like the way this one sounds even better, only because we never heard any results of it. There was never that conference. And I always thought that I really wanted to hear what they found, you know, but we weren't allowed to hear that. And so I would love to participate in the study. My, my, my question is though, um, when they come to do the MRI and the PET, Jimmy will not lay still. Do you use a date? He'd, he'd have to be, you know. Right, so, so that is, if they're, we, we're not gonna be prescribing medications, but if they're already taking medications um, that can be there for calming them down, then okay. yes, I would, we would encourage people to take that. The second part is, is that the PET scan, we split up intentionally. And so we try to have it only for, how many minutes is like 15 minutes that they have to lie? Is that correct, Liz? Like 35. 35, I lied. I, I, <laughs> they already caught me there, uh, 35. Um, but we try to break it up so they get an injection and there's a wait period. So yeah. often we yeah. will do is have the person in the scanner for the whole time. What we do is instead is, we inject, we wait a period of time and then put them in uh, the scanner at that particular, uh, particular time. So we try to be as um, accommodating as possible. And then the other points are, Liz does an absolutely amazing job. She's in the scanner with them, holding their hands, uh -huh. doing the stuff. And so- Not in the scanner. I can't fit in the scanner. Can't fit in the scanner. <laughs> but she's holding their hands and they're with them. And so the point of, the point of this is, is that, we really try to be as accommodating as possible to try to make sure that individuals have as good an experience as, you, as you've already heard. Um, our, our number one concern is their safety and also that we can make sure that they feel comfortable in the, in the situation. All right, thank you very much. Liz, did you have a point on the ask or add on there? I mean, I was just gonna say, a lot of times people will bring three scans which is a long day we can do that some people want to break it up and just do two and one it just it just depends so you you guys know your family members better than we do so we will accommodate whatever but when they're there the opportunity for information and stuff so part of the time it might be a little bit different now with COVID but I mean we're there with your folks the entire you know and we will like cards with them, we play Uno, we play things. I mean, you know, iPad and, you know, listen on their phone and everything like that, doing word searches, whatever. So there's always somebody there and they're, we try to keep them busy and, and entertained the whole time. So um, just whatever, whatever we can do to keep people, keep people engaged. And, and we have actually have had people that whose parents have said, you know, oh, my kid's not going to lay still. There's no way he's going to freak out in there and everything and have done amazingly well and just decided, oh, okay, well, we'll just try it. Just and so. totally surprise everybody. So, you yeah. never know. <laughs> okay. so Monica had a question and then I know Kathy had a question too. So Monica said, I'm um, not sure if Dr. Ansis can speak to this one, but I've seen some of it, info to indicate that our loved ones with DS are more at risk for the worst complications from COVID. Is this true? And my son is physically healthy, no other major medical issues. And the answer is there is some research out there. Uh, there's conflicting reports. Um, some have not seen a higher incidence of COVID-19 in Down syndrome community. However, there are there is a paper that recently came out because of the lung complications, because of the cardiac complications, there are and because of the diabetes, all of these are risk factors for having uh, a, a worse prognosis with with COVID if an individual were. There are inc there is a little bit of an increased risk. So yes, the answer is yes. There are instances where um, there are increased risk. We try to do as much as possible to to mediate those risks. So we'll ask you questions about uh, COVID. We'll be talking to you about any other contacts that are, we'll be taking temperatures of individuals. We do those kinds of things um, to make sure. And then 
for full disclosure, I am also doing the same temperature checks, same kinds of things when I'm coming into the hospital and doing that um, because I'm taking care of patients as well as I have family just as much and I have family members who have medical issues that would put them at risk. So we want to make sure that people are taking care of the best they can be taken care of and that the, it can be done. And then now what we're trying to do for, for, uh, for this study is, if you saw a lot of the neuropsych and that kind of stuff, we're trying to do more of, some of this stuff has to be done in, at, um, in, at the hospital setting or in the, in the physical places there. But if we can move some of those tests or some other kinds of things to be done at home, we're trying to move them to, to be done at home. Uh, we can't do the blood test yet at home. We can't do the lumbar puncture unless you guys all decide to become neurologists at home yet. Uh, we can't bring the MRI scanner to you yet or have an MRI scanner in your home. If you'd like to do that, we'll, we'll, we'd love to have a conversation with you. Uh, no, in reality, some of those things you have to come into for, for evaluation, but ways that we can make more of this done and the home setting, we are actively doing that and trying to do that, encouraging ways to, to figure that out as well. Kathy, you had a question. I hope that answered your question, Monica. Did I, did I do okay there? Okay, great, thank you. Kathy. Um, how firm are you on the, you have to be 25 years old to start the program? My daughter will be 23 in March. 25 is the cutoff, I'm sorry. Me too. Uh, I, I full disclosure. I wanted to go at eighteen because if you looked at those curves, I think that there are some very small changes that are occurring even at a younger age, and so because of that, I think it's very important. I am. I will go back. I will talk to people. I'm glad to, Kathy. Your question is a good question. I'm glad to talk to people again and ask them about changes, but right now the hard line is at 25 as of right now. Right, Liz? They haven't changed it. That's what they said, 25, right? Well, 25, yeah. But it's a good question. I think that's a great question. I'm sorry. I apologize. Other, other questions by everybody else? Please, I want to make sure I've answered your questions. Again, I can't thank, and I thank you guys. Uh, you, this, the, you're asking fantastic questions that are very realistic. Uh, 21, somebody, Debbie said 21. Yeah, I, I go to 21. Yes, uh, I, I, let's make it deal. I'm joking. Uh, the answer is I'd love to see it, um, but the rules for right now are at 25. But I think in the future on some of the studies, there may be at a younger age. Yes, Liz? But it's a five-year study, so even if um, she's not eligible right now. Right now, she would be eligible in the future. If she's 25, it's a five-year study. So if they're still enrolling when she turns 25, there's still potential for, for bringing her in. And we will be continuing to recruit people uh, for the study. So my answer to you is yes, we would we're, uh, we're still do that. And then if there are questions to, I know Monica was asking a question and Kathy's asking a question. If you're worried about any cognitive changes that are occurring and I see I'll see any ages, okay? So the answer is I'm more than glad in the clinic if you have questions about that, I'm glad to see them, okay? Dr. So Ansis, don't be worried was, about that. Excuse me, Dr. Ansis, yep. iPad too. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't see your name. Talking to me? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Here you go, hi. Hi, I'm um, I just need to ask a couple of questions. Um, I have a son, he's 34, Adam has Downs. And um, I also come from a very large family. There's 15 brothers and sisters in my family. The oldest brother um, uh, died from Alzheimer's disease when he was 72. And my youngest brother, who is 57, currently has Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And so it is a dual issue for myself. Mm. Um, I, I understand Alzheimer's has been around for a long time. And I think it really came to the forefront when Ronald Reagan ended up having it, people really became more aware. So this has been a very long time since this has been kind of in the building up to the forefront. When you talk about using Down syndrome um, individuals in your study, because they're predominantly more apt to obviously have Alzheimer's, um, what, you talk about the progression and now all the studies you're taking and using. What 
what timeline can you give me as far as to see something on, on reversing uh, the plaque, on, on stopping this horrific disease? Because in my estimation, I've seen a lot of diseases coming from a large family. This is, this is the most horrible disease I, I could ever imagine anyone could ever have. Um, and so since I'm on the bottom end of the family, I'm seeing the start of my older siblings. And right. so what, what type of a timeline do we have? Uh, my younger brother is 57 years old. Uh, his life is over at this point from his progression, what it, what's happening to him. Will there be a, a drug to reverse in say two, three, five, ten 10 years? Can we look forward to something like that with all this money that's going into it, all these people working into it? If I give my son over to this clinical study to help him as well as other people, it, I, 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 all, I, all I see are pills to slow down the, the rapid onset of this disease. But I'm not seeing anything that's coming out that is saying, wow, you know, this is gonna you know, take care of the plaque. This is going to you know, help get their mind back, bring back that person to us. Can you answer? And I know it's, it's something you sure. don't have an answer no. to, but there's gotta be some strong things coming down the pipe that give us hope. So there is a lot of hope. And I, 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 I hear your concerns and, you know, I, I worry about that same, those same issues because there's also family history in my family for Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's disease affects, if, if it, you don't know somebody that Alzheimer's disease affects, you're probably living under a rock. Um, right. I mean, because it, it affects, somebody that we either know, we, a family member, a friend, a neighbor, somebody we work with. It, it is a very common disease. We need to take a step back though in where, where we are and say what we've done. There have been a number of accomplishments, but there's a number of areas where we still need to improve. So it, we used to think about Alzheimer's disease in and of itself as this, you know, everybody got old, they got forgetful, that was just natural. And now we're starting to understand that that's not correct. And actually that a lot of these changes or these signs and symptoms are a gradual progression. So Alzheimer's discovered or named it or was named after him in like 1903. We've made significant progress over the last 100 and almost 20 years. Um, but really a lot of that progress has been made over the last say 15 to 20 years. So this whole idea of this amyloid and then now tau changes and now um, other kinds of uh, changes that we're seeing have only occurred in the last 15 to 20 years. I will give you an example of how much the field has changed, just me alone. So I will tell you that in medical school, we never heard about, never learned about a PET image. We never knew about spinal fluid measurements of Alzheimer's disease. We never even knew about blood measurements. The blood measurements have only been in the last year or two. So this field has radically changed and we now have a much better understanding. We have much better ways to now evaluate that never were ex even were in the textbook when I was a medical student. I'm not that old, okay? Uh, but I mean, the point is, is that it is radically changed and work that even Thomas is doing um, and in the lab is really making a big difference in the field. Has it led to a drug yet? The answer is no. I'm sorry to say it has not. The last drug that was approved for Alzheimer's disease was 19 years ago, okay? And the drugs that were approved were not the drugs that we administer right now. You may have heard of them, Aricept or Nomenda, mm -hmm. are small band-aids on a larger disease. They do not attack or reverse those amyloid or those tau changes. They're not for that, okay? They're for other kinds of brain neurotransmitters or ways that two brain cells talk. However, there are now new therapies that are out. There are now new clinical trials that are out to look at those anti-amyloid agents, these anti-tau agents. And I think, in fact, there was just in the last six months, 
uh, a company, Biogen, has already asked for FDA approval for an anti-amyloid agent for Alzheimer's disease, and it may get approved. And that will be the first drug that will be approved. So my answer to you is, is that there is a lot of hope. There is a lot of investment that has been going on in this. It's been tough because a lot of drug companies have not been, you know, they wanted a big bang for their buck. They haven't seen it, but there are a number, a number that are still involved. And then you see that there's been a large commitment by NIH and others, Alzheimer's Association included, that have been really focusing on this. We are really making and moving forward. And it's just, I mean, unbelievable that, you know, three years ago, we didn't even think that there was going to be a blood test. And now work that's actually been done at WashU and then at other places, there's going to be a blood test. There's going to be in the next couple of years, we're going to have a blood test approved. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. So I have a lot of hope. I have a lot of hope because I do think that things are moving. Uh, they got to move quicker. And how do we get things to move quicker? We have people like you, everybody who's on this on this Zoom call who are interested, who want to be, and who want to be participating in that. And that, by doing that, all of us working together, I think that's our best shot. I think, and I have, I have, I have big hope. And you're right. I, I'm, I'm going for my kids. Okay, mm -hmm. I want them. I want them to yeah. have that. Okay, so. Um, I think we have a lot, we have great opportunities though. I really do. Okay, thank you a lot. Hey Bo, hey Bo can yes. I just add one more thing to that? Um, so uh, as Bo has mentioned, um, my name, I'm Tom Mahan. I'm a graduate student at WashU. Um, and I've been doing Alzheimer's research for about nine years now. Um, I'm in my seventh year, my PhD in neuroscience. I'm hoping to finish up. Um, and when I graduate, I wanna get involved um, in the research uh, here at WashU, focusing on Down syndrome. Um, the reason for that is, is I have a four-year-old son with Down syndrome. Um, I also have a family history of dementia. Um, so for me, this is also uh, a big motivating factor. And I can say that, um, you know, I'm very fortunate to be in a lab with people that are incredibly dedicated to trying to create a world without Alzheimer's disease. Um, there's people across the world that are starting to realize just how important it is to develop therapeutics, to really tackle this disease. And I am incredibly fortunate. Um, like I said, I've been... Um, at WashU for about nine years. And I've seen the change over these last few years um, when it comes to recognizing the importance of doing research for individuals with Down syndrome. Um, my son was a part of a brain imaging study uh, when he was three months old, six months old, and 12 months old. They're starting to look at the development in Down syndrome, how it affects the brain. And there, we are at a wonderful moment in time where we are going to start to really be able to not only tackle Alzheimer's disease, but to make sure that creating that world without Alzheimer's includes individuals with Down syndrome. Thank you, Thomas. And I'm gonna be fighting every day. <laughs> you know, I mean, so, this, was, this was a great um, hour long informational uh, format for me. And, and I think throughout this, this whole time frame, I think it's, it was good to have this towards the end of, of the meeting to at least let people know that, that things are happening yeah. uh, more behind the scenes than probably what we are even aware of. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe my, my brother is in the WashU study currently right now because of the genetic factor of being so young again and, and getting it. Um, I, I, hope, I hope we see it <laughs> certainly within the next five years would be a blessing for many people. Sooner would be incredible. Um, so again, I just want to thank all the people that are working on this because it's we're heavily invested in my family. I know you are in yours and so many other parents with Down syndrome and children that, that are going to see what they're going to be going through as they age um, on top of everything else they go through. So again, thank you for all your time and effort and work that you're putting forth on this. We really appreciate it. Well, I, I want to say um, as a parent, thank you to all of you who are involved with this. Um, I realize that the opportunities that are available for my son come from those who have laid the path for him. Um, so to all you parents out there, um, to all those that are listening that have Down syndrome, um, you know, the adults that are participants, thank you. I mean, you guys are leading the way. And I know that my son is coming up in a much better world because of you. So I really want to say thank you.
Oh, that was nice, Tom. Thank you. All Thank right. you, Thomas. Are uh, there any other yeah. questions? <laughs> any other? I think this has been beyond my wildest dreams of <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> very, very much so. My daughter is 30 years old. And so when I think about going forward, I always think about like, what will her life be like as all, as all parents do. And as you said, they go through a lot anyway, but for something that they can't control, something that right. we as parents can't control, right. uh, that's the thing that, you know, that tightens up your belly when you think about 10 years from now. So to know that there are people out here like you, Dr. Bo, and Elizabeth and Olga and Bo and everyone in your lab and everyone throughout the, the United States as well as throughout the world that really believe in our folks. Cause you first off, first and foremost, you have to believe that our folks are worthy and obviously you do. And so to know that the people who think that our children are worthy and our young adults are worthy of having a life and those that come behind them of having a good life and that you're fighting like the Dickens to make sure that they do. You know, I don't have enough thumbs to go <laughs> thumbs up when we're on talk time, uh, our virtual uh, re our virtual program where our guys talk to us, you know, do you want to do something? And we say two thumbs up is really good. Well, if I had 10 thumbs, that wouldn't be enough to say, thank you very much for all that you all are doing. Thank you very much for this wonderful hour and a half that we've spent. I know we could stay on here forever and ever, <laughs> man, but we know that everyone is, is busy. But thank you, Dr. Bo. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Olga. Thank you, Bo. Thank everybody. Thank you, Thomas, for being on. Everybody and all mothers and fathers and everyone that have been on today. We really appreciate all of the information. Um, we're I'm glad to come back. I'm glad to present whatever other results we know. I'm, I'm here to give you as much information of what I do know and what I don't know, which is a lot. I don't know a lot, but I'm here to learn from you guys. So I think we're all in this together to, yes. to learn. So, so please, I'm glad to come back. And thanks so much for this outpouring and um, really those great words that Thomas, you said, and everybody else has said today. I mean, this has been uh, very humbling. So, so thank you. Thank you for letting us work with you guys. Mm -hmm.